All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And this will be our first Q&A uh, for the semester. It's going to be the regular time every uh, Wednesday, 4 p.m. And then we'll talk about the lecture videos that have been released to you, uh, possibly, uh, well, usually for other, about a week. Let me enable the transcription. All right. Good. All right. Okay, so for today, uh, usually, uh, let me just tell you uh, what I usually I'll, I'll try to do uh, for every week, so you can uh, expect some uh, consistency. I will typically start with maybe some announcement, just to make sure everybody is kind of up to speed about important items in case you haven't got a chance to check your email, but you should check your emails always, uh, at least uh, maybe a few times a, uh, a day, I think uh, maybe all of you are doing. And then I'll start and then I'll go ahead to talk about uh questions that are actually posted on the google doc i do have some not that many but some and then i'll and then after that i'll open the floor to see if you got any additional questions related to uh any study uh study materials we have made so far don't worry too much about asking me questions maybe it's about a, a few weeks ago that's okay the q a is really your time so uh, i will try to answer as many as possible if i really have to redirect your question to other time i will let you know but i'll definitely handle that and maybe after that, we can try to do hopefully at least a uh, one or two problems maybe per week. Uh, maybe for, for example, for this week, I chose uh, uh, like a, what well, I think is it's a rather challenging uh, recursion problem for us to solve. I'll try to maybe uh, go as detailed as possible and then let you guys do some follow follow up exercise. And then, yep, that'll be it, right? That's uh, roughly the layout. But if the actual Q&A for your lecture take too much time, in that case, we may have to delay. Uh, the uh, uh, extra uh, problem uh, section maybe to the next week. We'll see how that goes. But as usual, if you've got any question, concern, feel free to interrupt me. We'll put on the chat, all right? All right, good. But don't worry too much, too, don't worry too much about if the recursion problem might seem too challenging for you. I think uh, for, I think uh, struggling is okay. I think uh, I'll try to give you some, uh, give you some intuition about how you may actually solve that problem there. But, and then also maybe, oh, once I get there, I'll give you guys some idea. So we definitely have to deal with recursion uh, throughout the semester. Don't be too worried about, you have to deal with recursion all the time. It's gonna be your friend for the rest of your degree, for sure, all right? And then, uh, okay, let me see. Okay, it's mainly about you guys. Thank you for trying. I think that's good. Uh, let me see. Yeah, for tomorrow about the Q&A, I was trying to see if I can go, maybe go over maybe a different problem for recursion. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes, right? Uh, I just need some time to get prepared, maybe tonight. Okay, we'll see. All right. Let me talk about quick announcement, and then I'll go on to talk about uh, the question you have for the lecture. All right. All right, just for everybody's information, lecture week number two is released yesterday. So you have until maybe next Wednesday morning, next Wednesday early afternoon to make sure you really go over all the uh, uh, the lectures, right? So as I said, uh, let me just give you a little bit heads up about what's really coming as the assessment. If you go to the lecture site and go to the semester calendar over here, and then you can see we are now over here, right? We are now the 19th uh, of January. And your assignment one is coming, uh, I will release it maybe about 28th uh, of January, if uh, that, that'll, that'll be the plan, okay? And most likely the assignment will be about how to implement linked list. And I will start uh, talking about linked list, uh, uh, the concept and also implementation, uh, starting from week number three, that's what I would do. And then uh, your written test number one, it's uh, still a week, uh, a few weeks uh, away, but it might be nice for you to just keep in mind, your written test number one is, gonna, is coming uh on february uh 14th and 15th and you don't really want to actually procrastinate on watching or start uh, studying the lecture meet, uh, materials over here there will be four weeks of the material that we're going to cover you don't really want to delay all the watching of the videos right that's something you want to make sure you plan your time right let me see if i got anything All right, so some question about tomorrow. I think tomorrow I will I will not repeat, at least for the Google Doc questions. Uh, uh, once I talk about it today, uh, that's it, right? So I will just ask if people got any additional questions tomorrow about the lecture. I will possibly try to go over maybe another recursion problem tomorrow, right? So we'll see how the attendance has been, uh, will be like uh, for uh, 8.30 tomorrow. If it turns out to be uh, so inconvenient for everybody, in that case, maybe we, we can just focus on only Wednesday section, 
right? We'll, we'll see how that goes. Well, for those of you who actually just joined, don't worry, you haven't missed much. I think I'm just talking about some announcement to make sure everybody uh, is up to speed. You don't want to get lost, all right? Very good. And then uh, something I want to say that's kind of new, uh, which I suggested in the beginning of your week number two lecture, right? We will have to use quite a bit about Java generics, especially when we talk about in week number three, where we talk about linked lists. We'll talk, I will talk about how you can implement a linked list. Maybe I'll start with something basic, maybe only the linked list storing string values. But later on, we're going to learn about how to implement the uh, linked list uh, in a generic way, uh, which will be very uh, important for you to know as well. That's something we'll definitely cover. But before that, I would suggest for those of you who either did not learn about generics, uh, maybe from your early course, or if you did not actually uh, quite recall the details, this is what I would suggest. Uh, for this week while you're studying also for the lecture for week number two. Simply go to your weekly table over here, right? You can see week uh, week number two. Officially, it will start just from today, right? To actually get started to uh, start watching the video for week number two. You can see over here, we got background study section over here. That one suggests you simply just go to maybe uh, uh, the 2030, 421, right? The prerequisite for this course, go there and then look for these parts about generics. There actually tell you about the rationale behind why we're using generics and also uh, some very basic uh, usage uh, like a declaring generic classes and also how you can uh, declare uh, like a type of generic type right that's something uh, you want to review make sure if you want to brush up about generics I think that'll be the best resources that, that that's something I will assume you already know and then when I actually go ahead to the week number three I will actually show you more example about how to use generics right so guys take uh, take advantage of um, of uh, you know, getting some something, uh, maybe some preparation done before the uh, the actual things happen, right? Anyway, so that's about the background study. You will definitely see that reference in the beginning of week number two lecture as well. All right, that's about the announcement I would like to make. Not too many uh, for this week. We are only in week number two. All right, guys, do you have any administrative question for me before I go on to talk about your lecture week one? Anybody? Feel free. All right. All right. Uh, hearing none, I presume every uh, everything's clear so far, right? If there's any uh, important item which I think you should definitely know, I'll definitely reach out by announcement uh, do, uh, through E class. All right. All right. Let's now talk about your lecture. Okay. I got one, two, three, four. Uh, actually, three. I got three questions from Google Doc. Okay, three. Uh, some of them I try to combine them into one, so it will be more efficient for my presentation. So let's talk about this one here. I think this one here is uh, one of the exercises on your uh, slides. And then you guys were just wondering about, well, very good. You guys were wondering about how many primitive operations there are in this particular fragment of code. So let's talk about it. And then we'll do the exercise together as a problem. You, you're definitely uh, expected to know how to do such things uh, in the test later. All right, I got some question here. Let me just answer that quickly about generics. During the winter break, I tried practicing with generics, but the compiler didn't make uh, didn't let me make a generic array. I was wondering how this will affect our ability to make data structure, etc. Okay, the question is very good. Good question here. I think uh, uh, when you review the lecture uh, in twenty thirty, which I just pointed out to you, there would be some example code uh, in that particular site in the twenty thirty site for you to download and try. I think that one there actually has some example for generic array, if I recall correctly. But the bottom line is, when I actually cover week number three lecture, I'll try to make sure I also show you briefly about how you, you're supposed to uh, initialize generic array. You can definitely do it. But there will be some special syntax you have to know, which I'll definitely point it out to you. In case I didn't get a chance to incorporate it into the lecture, I'll definitely make sure I mention that in the Q&A. Either way, right? you definitely get, uh, you'll get the uh, guidance on that. All right, that's a quick response to your question. Good. So guys, sometimes I promise something I will definitely make available to you, but if I forgot, just remind me, right? Just in case, okay. All right, let's now take a look at this one here. And uh, this one here, I'm gonna go over, just go over directly. I presume everybody have seen this fragment of code. You may even got some answer on your sketch paper. You just wanna check whether your answer is correct or not, okay? Let me point out to you several things. First of all, to stop, two things I'd like to say before I uh, go on. So here you can see we got uh, names, 
dot length. Oh, sorry, names over here. Names dot length. Yeah, exactly. So here, here we're assuming that names is simply a string array, as I pointed out in the lecture, right? For our convenience of uh, of uh, analysis, let's just say whenever we talk about names that length, let's just use, uh, use n, right, to denote the input size number one, and number two, which I also talk about in detail uh, in lecture in week number two. I want you to look at this while condition over here. All right, we know very well from your 1022 or 1021. If you got a while loop and you have a Boolean condition in the middle over here, we uh, and the uh, the meaning uh, the execution meaning is as long as this condition over here remains true, we are going to keep executing the body of the loop. We know very well. But now, I in order for us to make it uh, in order to make it easier for us to make the analysis, we want to know the opposite. Under what circumstances will the while loop exit? Let me pose the question. You can uh, you can think about it, and then I'll definitely tell you the answer. The question is, when will the while loop exit? There's a logic behind that, right? So uh, let me just go directly to that, right? We know that we're going to exit from the loop if this boolean condition evaluate to false which means it is not the case it is true right that's obvious and let's now try to do a little bit logic uh logical manipulation here to get a precise answer so we know we know that it's going to exit when okay not the case and uh since all of you actually already took 1019 or possibly 1090 you know about some logical negation, logical conjunction symbol, right? So I assume you know. If you don't know, you can reach out to me. I can go over some of them with you. It is not the case that, it is not the case that, and we have not found empty string. Oh, actually, let me write better. Not found empty string. Okay, and over here, okay? So that's conjunction i strictly less than names that length let me say n over here all right hopefully so far so good and this logical uh expression over here is equivalent to right you guys know about the morgan i'm pretty sure you heard about it right so you can distribute the negation over into conjunction right so let me just remind you about a rule very basic rule so if you say not the case p and q it is equivalent to not p or not q right we simply negate both p and q and also flip from conjunction to disjunction and similarly you can also distribute uh over disjunction in which case you will flip disjunction to conjunction that's the morgan all right that's something i assume you know all right let's now do uh the morgan quickly and then we'll know the answer so if i try to distribute first of all this one to here right is going to be not not double negation which means the original thing so that means equivalent to found empty string and then flip conjunction to disjunction and then i less than n if you put a negation on that it's going to be i larger than or equal to n over here right so this will be what i call the exit condition for the while loop which is the logical negation of this orange over here. All right, so it's really important for you to know that because when you do algor algorithmic analysis, you don't necessarily um, actually always get uh, just the full loop, which typically you will know exactly how many iteration you will take because of the syntax for the full loop. You might just get a while loop. So this is also discussed when we talk about in week number two, a sorting algorithm called insertion sort. Well, I'll, I'll also address this again. So if you don't exactly get it, you will get a chance to uh, revisit that, all right? All right, hopefully so far so good. It's called the exit condition, all right? So these are the two things I want to mention first before we do the analysis, right? We want to say, first of all, names that length will just be n. And also we want to analyze about under what circumstances will we exit from the loop. So that will also help our analysis. If you look at this over here, we are saying that we will exit from the loop if either we have already found an empty string, 
meaning that we're simply just gonna uh, maybe return true, or maybe we know that we found an empty string, so we can print an error message to the user saying that uh, you actually got an empty string in your array, for example, right? We can exit from the loop, so this will be the early exit, right? It's really important to point this out. So this will be for early exit, meaning that before you can exit, before you have examined all the elements in the array, so that's for early exit, meaning that it's not the worst case. On the other hand, if you look at i larger than or equal to n, so this will be when i is invalid index. And this would be the worst case in the sense that you have to examine the entire array, meaning they're going to go over all the n elements. All right. That's something you have to uh, make sure you understand. All right. And as we calculate the primitive operations, we have to always deal with the worst case. We don't deal with the best case, right? The best case could just be constant, of course, if you already found an empty string in the very first iteration. Of course, that's not something we're considering. We're going we're gonna to consider the worst case. All right, so knowing that, we're going to consider the, this worst case over here. So now, this is one question I will ask, uh, I would like to ask everybody over here, which is similar to what I post uh, in, the, uh, in the lecture, okay? Let me, uh, let me put this one over here, okay? If you can think about this particular expression, uh, Boolean expression over here, okay? Let me put it here. I got two questions. Once we answer them, uh, you will be very quick to actually solve the, uh, the rest of the things. Question number one. How many times? Uh, let me say number of times. Number of times this particular Boolean expression, which I box in purple, evaluated. That's number one. Question number two, the number of times the body of loop executed. Both will be crucial to our final answer since we want to be precise. All right. Yeah, guys, uh, share your answer if you want to. And try not to use the uh, names that length anymore since we are, use, uh, we are naming the uh, name start length as n, right? That'll be easier for me to, to try. Mm -hmm. We got two questions here, Q1 and also Q2, right? Okay. I see n plus one and n. That's good. It's not too bad. All right. So let me just do a little bit more brief uh, explanation. You can definitely refer to the more uh, complete uh, uh, explanation back in the uh, lecture when I talk about a for loop. If you think about this, let's say the names array is like this, right? It's simply an array over here. And then we'll simply go from zero all the way to n minus one, right? And then we said that what's going to happen is there will be, uh, well, the number of times, the number of times that the body of the loop is going to be executed correspond to how many times this Boolean expression will evaluate to true, plus another time where the Boolean condition will be evaluated to false, meaning that it's time to exit. But for that last time, we don't really go any further for the uh, for the um, uh, execution execution for the body of the loop, right? To sketch that very quickly, if you think about the uh, loop counter over here, initially it's simply just zero, so we'll go for zero, one, all the way to n minus one, right? And then you can see that we will exit from the loop when it is larger than or equal to n, right? So over here, over here, you can think about up to this part over here, i larger than or equal to n, I, you know what? i larger than or equal to n is simply false, meaning that, let me try to correspond to uh, the condition over here. That'll be easier, okay? Let me look at this condition specifically. So for all these, i strictly strictly less than n, right? Remember this condition here, uh, this uh, expression here is n will be true. So that means the body of the loop will actually uh, will, will, will have to go go for the iteration, right? That's something what we said in the lecture. And for the very final time, when it is incremented to n, in that case i less than n, so n less than n will just be false. So that means we're going to exit, 
right? Pretty much consistent with what I said. So the answer will be for this diff, uh, for this first one over here is going to be go from zero all the way to n. So that'll be n plus one. n plus one times we got to evaluate this uh, condition, and for the first n times, it's going to be true, and for the last time, it's going to be false. All right. And then what about number of times the loop body will be executed is going to be just n. All right. Any questions so far? So always, this uh, if you want to calculate the number of primitive operation that involve a loop, this is something you have to make sure you can answer, right? Okay, knowing uh, these two, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so as a general rule, is it usually the case that uh, the condition in the loop happens just one exactly one more time, more than the body of the loop? Exactly one more time. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, you can you can think about it's more like a property. So these two questions are interconnected for sure. You can think about the reason that this will be exactly one more. If you go from here to here, it's exactly one more is because when it evaluate to false, it is the only time that you don't really execute the body of the loop for another time. So that's why. Yeah, it's always the case. That's correct. I see. Thank you. Good. Good question. Very good. Good observation. All right, guys, so now we know the critical question. Let's now calculate, all right? Let me try to write uh, on uh, to the left of the uh, each line, okay? Let's, let me use uh, uh, orange, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, orange. All right, line number one, we got only variable assignment, right? Over here, false is just a constant, so we, we wouldn't count it, all right? So just one. And then over here for line number two, only the variable assignment over here, and then just one. For line number three, okay, alone. If you only look at uh, the uh, you, if you look at, only look at this particular boolean condition, uh, this boolean condition here, just it alone. How many primitive uh, primitive operations are there? Tell me your answer. Just this part alone. Don't worry about how many times it will be evaluated. We'll get to that part. Only this alone. How many? Only this part. Okay, four and four. Okay. Let's see if that's the case. First of all, we got some, you can see ex, uh, exclamation mark. So that will be some uh, logical operation and conjunction number two, and also relational operator. And also we are trying to get access to the length, right? So we got four in total, all right? Good. And then, so now we have to know how many times do we actually evaluate this particular expression? As we said, it's going to be the answer to this, Q1. So it's going to be 4 multiplied by n plus 1, right? Multiply by n plus 1. Because we know every time we evaluate this condition over here, it's going to be exactly 4. And we said already in Q Q1, it's going to be n plus 1 times that we're going to evaluate this in the worst case. All right? So far, so good. And then before I get to, uh, let's analyze just for a single iteration, just a single one, right? For any single iteration, uh, let me just use the green over here, just for a single iteration, that's exactly, uh, I'm sure the box in green over here. Let's see. For a single iteration, array indexing, and then we also got the inquiry about the length of a string. As I mentioned in the lecture, it should be a constant time operation, right? Just one, okay? And also relational operation over here. And also we got assignments over here. And then we got arithmetic over here. And also we got variable assignments. So how many do we get? One, two, three, four, five, and six. We got six in total. All right, for each iteration. So that'll be six for each iteration. But how many iterations do we have? In worst case, n. All right, so that'll be six multiplied by n. Uh, let me try to write that so you can so you can think about each time it will be six and we got n iterations all right and that's it all right so now we got to add up all the numbers okay so we're gonna do the math over here it's gonna be uh one plus one plus n plus one multiplied by four and then plus six n right and let's try to simplify that uh quickly so that'll be so so that'll be 4n plus 4, right? 
four n times six n will be ten n. Plus four plus five plus six. I hope I did it right. Let me check again. One, two, and then six. Okay, six over here, and then four n, six n. Yep, ten n plus six. That should be the final answer. Right? I see what you mean. I think uh, when we calculate the uh, when we usually when we count the number of primitive uh, primitive operation, we at least uh, as far as this uh, course is concerned, we don't really analyze the logic of the course. Even though I think you're right, you're saying that we if we are able to get into the if statement over here, that means we are able to exit from the loop early. I understand your point. However, whenever we try to calculate just the number of prim primitive operations. Uh, in the worst case, that worst case sometimes may not necessarily happen. Right? In this case, of course, if you ever actually get into this particular part, you will exit from the loop anyway. So it cannot be the worst case. But I think uh, for us, we just want to calculate line by line and make sure we are able to multiply by the number of iterations. That's what we would do. So do that makes sense to you? Good. All right. So guys, do you have any concern or questions or doubts about this uh, kind of exercise? Oh, another one's, uh, okay. The compiler doesn't assume. What do you mean? What do you mean it doesn't assume? Okay, uh, yeah, for that question, I need some clarification about uh, the compiler. Uh, is there a place where we can find more exercises like these where we need to count the number of um, You know, I think that the best way to do, you guys up to this level, you can make up any uh, Java code you like, right? With a loop and then with some if statement and then something like that. Um, I, I would say you can uh, come up with any Java example and then try to count the primitive op uh, number of primitive operations. If you really, really want to check your answer, come to me and then I can check together with you. Yeah, that's what I will do in the test as well. I'll try to maybe go back to your maybe uh, 1021, 1022, or 2030 uh, course, and then I'll try to see if there's any fragment of code uh, for which it will be interesting to count the number of primitive, uh, primitive operations. That's what I would do, right? So I would encourage you guys to go back to uh, your uh, archive of the Java code, and then find, uh, don't find a too complicated one, find some simple one to start with and try to count. If you got any doubts about if your answer is correct or not, drop, drop by my office hour, all right? Good. So Sarah, you actually got a question about compiler. I wasn't sure about it, but if you don't worry about it, if you uh, want to clarify further, you can let me know. All right. Okay. Seeing no. Uh, oh, Adnan, go ahead, please. I didn't see. Um, yes. Sorry, sir. Uh, I I actually saw some questions online that was doing that maybe it's a little bit different. They were counting O of uh, N. For example, this is probably O of N. For sure. Complex. For sure. Mm -hmm. Um. I was wondering if you're gonna do something like that, maybe like exponential O of two. I'm wondering what the, what would an O of uh, exponential look like, or like uh, oh exponential. Um, um, are are we gonna do like double loops, like uh, yeah, you non know, nested loops and stuff? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So let me let me mention that it is a valid question here. So let's be uh let's go to what what's really relevant to you guys about assessment. Okay. So in your tests or exam, there are, there are uh, typically two kinds of questions I can ask related to this kind of subject, okay? So given a fragment of code, fragment of code, okay, give a, give a fragment of code, I can ask you either to count the number of primitive operations precisely okay and number two is to approximate the asymptotic running time and for this please refer to your week number two lecture i did uh, about five different examples actually you know what i did seven examples in total about the second category. So let me give you a little bit brief. Um, let, let me just give you some idea. So give you a little bit more motivation, maybe to even start tonight. Okay. If you go to your week number two lecture over there, okay, 
uh, I'll give you some idea over here. If you go to the slide, guys, by the way, you should really hit the refresh button of your web, uh, web browser. I'm using the same file, but it's not being expanded to 41 slides, the same lecture, right? Just make sure you actually uh, refresh, okay? I'll give you some example over here. You will see that in your, uh, over here, you will see some example. Is it, uh, this is where we left off uh, from last time, from last week, from week number one, okay? And for week number two, for week number two, I didn't give you any more examples re related to counting the number of primitive, uh, primitive operations, right? Not anymore. But I'm talking about a second kind of question I can ask, which might be more common. Right, that one there is to say, given a fragment of Java code, for example, something like this, you don't really need to calculate exactly how many primitive operations, but you just need to approximate. Just maybe what, uh, maybe just to listen more carefully about what I said in the lecture. I give you some tips about how you can do. Okay, and then the challenging one would be this one over here. Okay, this will be the one. Of course, you, you can see the answer already, but it's not important. I would say it's much more important to know about exactly how to derive or to approximate the running time. So you will see, uh, you will see what I mean when you get there. Okay. And then the absolutely more challenging uh, example I did uh, in week number two is another set of lecture. If you go to lecture number two uh, over there, we only cover the very uh, beginning part for lecture number two. In that case, uh, you can see we talk about selection sort. You can see this is uh, with nested loop. In that case, you have to also analyze its running time. But we didn't really calculate the precise number of primitive operations, but we just try to approximate it. That would be one example and also insertion sort. So these are uh, these two are very good case studies to see how complex your nested loop might uh, get into. I also trace in detail together with you to understand exactly uh, how, uh, how they're supposed to work. Right? That's something you will learn in week number two. All right? Very good. That's okay. You know, I only released it yesterday. I just want to motivate you guys to uh, start as early as you can. Right, so uh, I think uh, when, when I released uh, maybe the guide for written test number one, I'll try to give you guys maybe more example, and uh, I can even maybe bring example maybe uh, next week. Because for this week, you haven't really seen, uh, you haven't really been taught about how to analyze uh, running time. Maybe for next week, I can bring some additional problem for us to solve about given some Java code, how can you approximate the running time? That's something I can do next time. All right. Alrighty. All right, so. Seems like we're okay for that for that one there. This might be uh, take the most time. I think the next two are pretty straightforward. Okay, it's just for clarification. And so basically, the question over here is about. Let me see. Uh, I see. The question itself is about one of the example which I show in the lecture one example about proving the big O. So what I want to mention is whenever you're trying to uh, prove something about, for example, if you want to prove, let's say f of n, which is equal to, let's say, 3n plus uh, maybe uh, 8 over here, right? So there are different ways to prove it for any uh, uh, any function over here, right? So there, there are multiple ways to prove things. There are multiple ways for proving this. And if you're only asked to prove about this particular uh, function being big O of n, of course, as long as you can choose the C and also n zero, such that this upper bound effects is going to happen, as long as you can show that, it would be acceptable, right? And about using the proposition, well, if you use the proposition that we spoke about in week number one, you will simply choose the C to be three plus eight, and also n zero will just be one automatically, right? It's guaranteed to work. However, you are more than uh, you are not bounded by choosing another example. Maybe you will choose another constant, and uh, which will make n zero either remain to be one or maybe larger than one. That's okay. So if we really ask you to really provide a proof, we are not really restrict you uh, restrict uh, you to only give uh, one uh, like a c uh, one example for c and n zero to uh, to do right, unless we say you must choose the minimum possible c and minimum possible n zero. If that's the case, then you have to be careful. All right, that's something I want to uh, uh, mention. Another question over here is kind of similar. Uh, that's something I want to mention as well. Remember this example over here, okay? This example over here, that's uh, one of the uh, example number one that we did. 
And for this one here, I said to really uh, apply the proposition, we'll simply add up uh, the multiplicative constant, the absolute values, and we got 15. And your fellow student correctly pointed out, can we simply use the constant C over here being 12, right? The answer is yes, you can do that. Like what I said earlier, there are multiple ways for you to prove about a big O. And for those of you who might be wondering, you can definitely try this one over here. So this one is talking about C being 12 and also N0 being just one. This will also be okay. So in this case, the solution I gave to you is actually 15. And your fellow student was suggesting 12. If you try to apply this one here, you will also satisfy the upper bound effects. That's also fine. Okay, that's also fine. On the other hand, the another way I might ask you in the test or exam would be, I might just give you one instance of the C and N0. I will ask you to tell me whether that would be a valid combination of the witnesses about C and N0. You can just tell me true or false. That's another way. That's like a, like a backward way I can ask you right, about the proof. All right, hopefully that's clear. The bottom line, if you're only asked to prove about a function being the bigger of something, so that will be more like a written question. In that case, you can give any C and N0 as long as they actually work for the upper bound effects by definition, okay? Or it could be that I might simply say, I give you the function over here and I give you the big O. And then I will say it's a multiple choice. I will say, consider the following list of witnesses for C and N0, choose those that would be valid witnesses to prove. That would be another way to, uh, to consider, right? All right, I think that's about everything I saw on the Google Doc, right? Do you guys have any follow-up, any more questions related to lecture? Before I talk about recursion, which will be fun. Professor? So I had a small doubt. Oh, uh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, maybe I'll let, uh, yeah, go ahead first. Okay, yeah, so I made a small mistake while writing my questions in the Google Doc. Sure. Um, I have posted two questions in the for loop um, section. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was like going through like today, I found out that th this was like, I wanted to ask these same questions for the while loop. The while loop, you mean over here? Yeah, so um, while when we, um then in the in the lecture videos you discussed while loop right so i just wanted to ask that what is the you know primitive operations in the loop body which i got because we just discussed that sure. and my second mm -hmm. um uh question was that what will be the number of uh, primitive operations in the whole uh program so like um in the sense if if this is the function we discussed like these you know nine lines mm -hmm. Okay. And um, if we write it as like a full program, so do we consider any, um, you know, other primitive operations? Like if you could come up with any, as I don't really know to how just um, include the uh, this function in a program. But if in case you ask for a whole program, this is like just a one function or nine lines. What would be the answer for like the whole program? uh okay let me try to follow you maybe i didn't really understand uh, understand correctly are you talking about this program here specifically or you're talking about a for loop program no just the while loop. just this one here right and yeah, your yeah. and what's your question again if you can tell me again so like if there are like you know maybe double loops or you know both mixed then how would we um find out oh like, you mean if there's a nasty loop like a if there's a nested yeah, loop, nested how loop. would you find out uh, exactly how many primitive operations there are, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. You know what? This one here, let me cover that possibly tomorrow or next week about how you can count primitive operation from the nested loop. That's something maybe I can do, maybe to show everybody an example. How about we do that tomorrow? Okay. If, I just, if I just sketch the idea right now, everybody might be confused. Let me prepare for that, and then I can present that either tomorrow or next week. Would that be okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Sure. Let me make a note uh, over here. So either tomorrow or next week. So we will do one example on counting number of primitive operations from nested loop. 
that that would definitely more be more challenging. But let's do it together, so you will be more ready for your test or exam. Okay, why don't we do that? Yeah, this one could be on the test, could be on the exam. But let me prepare something to actually show to you how to do it. All right. I think there was another question. So would you like to speak up? Right. So I remember you saying that a possible question would be like you gave us a C and like initial n value yep. and asked if it was valid. Correct. For those type of questions, right? Uh, I remember you about telling us to check by doing it for more than one value. So how many values should I check before I just mm. conclude that it's valid? Yeah. So as well, basically, I, I would say typically, uh, if the upper bound, if, well, remember the example we did, uh, the, the log example we did in the lecture, where n0 is not really one, it has to start from two. I would say typically once uh, once we uh, see the upper bound effects over here already, so that should be the starting point. And you can, because usually the function will just grow uh, from there. So you wouldn't really decrease unless you actually got some minus uh, value over there. That's something you will have to judge case by case. So I would say, if you can see that the, the function apparently is growing, in that case, as long as the very first value, like n0, is already satisfying the upper bound equation over here, then you can safely assume it's going to be fine. I, I don't think there's going to be any tricky on that. You just be, uh, you just got to watch out if the log is actually in, uh, part of the equation as we learn in the lecture. So in that case, n0 may not be one always. Okay, so yeah. so just check the first value. I have to check the like, first one. Like, the first and second. Like, yeah, I would say typically check the first and second. If the first and second already work and you can see the gap, uh, well, let's say for example, if you got c is equal to just hypothetically c is equal to maybe eight, and zero is equal to one, and then you try to check it over here, and then you can maybe check one more to see n uh n zero. Uh, let's check to see what if uh n is equal to maybe uh two over there right just make a, a larger value over there and if you can see the function is apparently the function value is growing from one to two the trend is gonna be uh, like that without uh, uh changing so that means you can safely assume it's gonna be fine okay so if it hurts to hold basically for the first two i'll be okay for, for the first for, for the first two yeah you should be okay but just watch out for the lock lock would be the tricky one to make sure okay yeah, yeah. but aside from log there's nothing else right yeah yeah no, nothing else should be tricky exactly okay okay thank you good no problem yeah good but i guys i think uh, just for a little bit heads up as far as i know my colleagues uh in the uh who teach uh usually 3101 they like to ask you some very tricky questions on on the big o but not for me i think uh, as long as you can understand what i really said in the lecture you should be okay at, le at least for the big o right i don't think that the big o itself is really should be that tricky for this course but I will, well, anyway, so. All right, so let's now talk about recursion, okay? You know, guys, I should have uh, done a poll. Actually, there's something I can do next time. Can you guys just tell me roughly, you can type on the chat, give me some idea, right? I want to know where you are at the moment. From, for those of you who already tried the problem over here, you know, about the uh, group of sum, from level one to 10, one to 10, one is the easiest, 10 is the hardest. How would you assess this problem over here? Give me some idea. So I would know what extra problem we should really come, uh, I should come up with for later. Give me some idea, okay? Okay, I'll pause for a few more, more, a uh, few more moments and then good. Okay, roughly about eight. Okay, roughly about eight, seven, six. Definitely, definitely on the hard side. To be honest with you, I don't think this uh, problem is easy, first of all, right? But you know, I think that's really uh, the advantage that we can spend time going over the solution and going over spending more time on the rationale, which I really cannot do in the lecture, right? That's okay. Um, guys, we'll, uh, let, let's still go over the solution and uh, design for the solution today as well. Uh, I'll give you the, the type code as well, uh, for sure. You can play with it. However, if you believe that this one is about eight, Maybe what I should do is I should really give maybe some easier ones just for you to get a little bit more solid uh, scales before we can try another uh, uh, difficulty uh, eight problem. I think that might be the way to uh, to go, right? Okay, let's definitely do that. But you know, just for your interest, why don't we try to see how this can be solved, right? Why don't we try that? 
I can tell you that the solution itself is incredibly intuitive and easy. I'm just saying once we get a code, right? I'll try to give you guys some idea about how to think about it. And of course, just to share with you, even for myself, it didn't really quite click on me for recursion in 2011. When I study in my uh, at York, you know, many years ago, it only click on me when I uh, more got to my uh, third or fourth year, right? That's uh, that's the thing. But of course, in this course, at least understand at least the recursion I, I teach you. Then I think you should be okay uh, for the test and for the exam. All right. Okay. Good. Yeah. That's that's very good. Uh. So. Uh, Uma, uh, Umier, so you said that you look, you look at the solution and hence you're very, it's very elegant. I, I will tend to agree. It's pretty concise, pretty short. I will try to give you guys another uh, solution, which I, I think is very intuitive to my understanding. Right. So hopefully that will help you guys think. All right. OK. No worries, guys. Let's uh, talk about it. All right. Uh, can I? Okay, let's go over the problem together in case uh, you haven't really uh, looked at that yesterday, but that's okay. Let's now talk about it. Okay. So now, given an array of integers, is it possible to choose a group of some of the integer? By the way, the group does not need to be uh, adjacent. It could be, I choose, uh, in this case, of course, I can choose 2 and 8, which uh, 2 plus 8 will be 10. And also in this case, I can do 2 plus 4 plus 8. It can be 14. You can see intuitively, it sounds like a, it seems like very difficult. You simply don't know how many numbers you should really choose. You simply don't know. There are many possibilities, right? And also here, for example, you can see there, might, there are many ways to choose the number. It can be that it, it's, you only choose two, in which case it's not equal to nine. You can choose two and four, the sum will be six, which is not equal to nine. You can try to choose maybe two and eight, also choosing two numbers. Again, the sum is 10, which is not equal to nine, and etc. It sounds like if you were to program this, maybe not recursively, but using a loop, I can tell you that it's gonna be incredibly uh, challenging. And I remember what uh, Adnan was asking me about exponential. In order for you to really figure out the solution in the loop, one way is to do exponentially, which means you gotta try out all the possible ways to choose the number from the array, okay? That's uh, oh, you know what? Let me do. Let's do a little bit of math over here, right? So let's say we got the array over here, two, four, and eight. Here is my question for you. How many possible groups of numbers can be? chosen all right anybody I, I saw some answer over there okay two to the power of three all right that's good right you know mathematically speaking it's actually not difficult right it's something maybe you did maybe in your probability course over here the idea would be for each number over here you got two choices like a binary choice either to include or to exclude. Similarly, for every number in the array. So that's why you can you can either choose to include or not to include. Choose to include or not to include. Or choose to include or not to include. So that's why two to the power of three. That'll be the answer, right? So rather than three choose uh, one, two, three. No, you don't really use a choose operator over here. I think this one is about for each number in the array, we have the choice about either to choose it well, not to choose it. To be more precise, like I'm, I'm already building a solution. Okay, I'm um, intuitively. I'll write a code in a moment. Okay. Let's think about this. If I actually got two, three, four, let's consider this particular input. We want to see how many groups exactly, right? Eventually, it'll be four. This is how I would suggest you actually try to enumerate the possibility. Okay. So here we let's say we start from here. This is our starting point. All right. And then we are going to go over about let, let me just say index zero, index one, and index two. Right? Let's say that this is some input array, A. All right. Whenever I want to make a choice, and for A at index zero, I can choose either to choose it or not to choose it. Agree? 
In the case I choose it, in that case, I will choose two into the group, right? So that means the sum of all the numbers I have chosen will be just two. And in the case I don't choose it, so far the sum will just be zero. Right? Hopefully so far so good. And then when I get to the second number over here, I'm doing the same thing. Here, given that I have already chosen a zero in the previous one, right? We're kind of memorizing the tree. That's why drawing a tree would be the best way to understand exactly what's going on and to be systematic about numerating all the choices. Here, I got two over here. I got also two choices over here. Either I will choose to, uh, I will choose A1 or not to choose A1. And over here, I will choose A1 or not to choose A1. Right, so A1 is actually three. In the case I choose A1, that'll be three. So three plus two, it would be five. In the case I don't choose A1, so that means the sum will remain to be two. Right, so far so good. And in this case, if I having having chosen so far, we got zero, right? And now if I chose uh, if I chose uh, three, uh, which will be A1, zero plus three, that'll be three. And if I don't choose anything, that'll be simply just uh, zero. Okay, let's finish the next level and then I'll tell you why this will be important to understand before we program it up, okay? All right, let's now try to go further. And now let's say for five over here, for each one of them, we still have two choices, okay? Each one of them. Either we can choose to, we either we can choose a, uh, A2 or not to choose A2. I can choose A2 or not to choose A2. Choose A2 not to choose A2, and choose A2, and not to choose A2, right? And A2 is actually four over here. So that means over here I got, so either four plus five, it will be nine. And five plus zero, since I didn't choose it, so that'll be five. Two plus four is going to be six. And two plus zero, since I didn't choose it, it'll be two. Three plus four is gonna be seven, because I chose it, and three plus zero, I didn't choose it, so that'll be three. And zero plus four is going to be actually uh, four. And then zero plus zero, since I didn't choose, that'll be zero. So now, why is this tree so useful? Well, we'll, we'll talk about tree uh, after the reading week, but even without me formally introducing to you, it's kind of intuitive way to really draw things and keep track, okay? For example, you can see this. If you try this, this is starting point over here. And then you say, if I simply don't choose anything right from the beginning, which means I don't choose A0, I don't choose A1, I don't choose A2, it makes sense. The group of the sum of the group of number will just be zero. On the other hand, for example, if I say I want to choose A0, choose A1, and choose A2, in that case, it will just be nine because there'll be two, three, and four. And let's see one more. Okay. What if I say over here? I would say choose a zero, don't choose a one, and choose a two. In that case, it will be six. So this one over here really correspond to if you have chosen the following group, which means you have chosen a set which, which will contain a zero and also a two. A zero and a two, so that makes sense. It will just be six. And you can see in the bottom of the tree, we call the leaves of the tree. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got eight possible consequences depending on how you choose. Guys, I hope so far you're okay, right? Just to get some intuition, right? Now, in, if you really want to explicitly program directly this tree, it will be difficult. However, if you're able to write your program in a way such that when it is executed at runtime, this will be how the call stack is like. That'll be much easier. And that's exactly why recursion, recursion will be the right way to solve this problem over here. So I'm gonna program a solution there. Okay, I'm gonna put uh, type it out on Eclipse. And then what's gonna happen is, once you see the code over there, you want to convince yourself after today, I think that's a very good uh, exercise for you to really try to see. The call stack at a runtime for this particular input will look exactly like this tree over here. I'll try to give you some idea once I write a code, right? 
So guys, are you okay so far? Just about uh, at least you're okay with this tree over here, right? Hopefully you are not lost. I'm only talking about the uh, idea. Good, good. All right. Let's now program that. Okay. Let's now. Okay. I want to confess. I I tried this out yesterday night. It took me uh two attempts to get it right. Uh, on a coding bed, uh, it took me about fifteen minutes. That's why I said fifteen minutes for you guys. Okay. And another uh one question for Adnan. How do we traverse this tree? In your method implementation, implementation, you don't have to. You don't need to traverse the tree. This tree structure here cannot be seen in any way in, in the program of which I'm going to write to you. I'm going to write in front of you. What's going to happen is when you execute the input and things actually happen at the runtime behind the scene. That's how this tree will be built up on the fly. Okay, that's something you can keep in mind. But I will see exactly uh, how, how that goes. Having this intuition over here, let's now try to program that together. Okay. Um, let's now go to Eclipse over here. I'll make this source code available to you today. No problem. Okay. So you can definitely try to do it again. Uh, if you got another thoughts, that's not a problem. Okay. So let me now go to. Uh, okay. We got about twenty to thirty minutes left. Right. I'll be quick. Okay. What I will do is I'm gonna create uh just one uh class over here. Let me just say model and tests. Right. That's some convention we're gonna follow for uh, uh, throughout the course as well. One package called model over here. Another package called tests, okay, over here. And then I'm going to actually say uh, in the model, let me call the recursive methods, okay. Okay, and then another one over here, let's say GUnit test case. Let's call it uh, let's unit test four. That's what we're gonna use, and then we're gonna say let's say test recursion, and then okay over here. Right, I'm gonna write a JUnit test in a moment once I put put the methods. Right, so what we're gonna do over here, if you go to coding back, I included a link uh, over there. Uh, when you see the note today, also I included a link yesterday. Uh, I'm pretty sure you know how to get there. All right. So let me just go there uh, to coding bets over there. Give me a moment. So let me go to coding bet, right? So this is the method that we want to program, right? And then I'm going to go to Eclipse over here. Just copy and paste. Okay. And of course, it's only complaining that I'm not returning anything, right? I'll just say return false just for now. Okay, it's good for now. Good. All right, so let's now talk about it, right? Here, uh, this is the starting point that we're going to look at the array, right? You can think about when I go back to my example over here. If this is the array, the method that we're trying to program will be general enough. You can say the group, the choosing process may start at any index. I might say I want to start a choosing process from this index over here, in which case I'm going to scan through the entire array to decide whether to choose this or not, whether to choose this or not, and whether to choose this or not. That'll be the maximum uh, choices I can make. On the other hand, I can also pass some number over here rather than simply just zero, I can pass maybe just one. What does it really mean when I pass one? If I simply pass one, uh, let's say here, if I say group sum, group sum over here, and then if I say index rather than zero, I'm going to say one, and then the reference to the array A, the input. Let's say I want the sum to be maybe five, for example, right? What does it really mean? If I do this one over here, that means I, I my choosing process is going to ignore any indices that's less than one. So that means I, I don't even inc uh, consider this. I will actually start choosing from here. So now either choose one or exclude one, either to choose two or exclude two. In this case, it should be false because there's no way for me to choose from these two numbers and make a group such such that the sum will be five, right? That's kind of the idea, right? So this math is very general. I want you to, first of all, understand about what this start is over here, okay? And the nums over here is simply the input array for you to make a choice. A target is simply how many, uh, what will be the ultimate sum you want to reach, all right? And 
I am going to present a different solution, a solution that's different from what you saw in the hints uh, and also in the coding back. That one's not too bad, but I would say this one may be uh, easier to understand. May not be exactly easy, but easier. All right. What I will do is I'm going to create, which you will often have to do uh, for recursion. You want to create something so-called recursive helper methods. You can think about the reason that you want to create a recursive helper method is you want to have some additional information you want to keep track of between the recursive call. Okay, to keep track of keep track of some intermediate result. In this particular case, we want to see what's the sum so far. Right. If you remember over here, the sum so far is the two zero five two three zero and these guys, etc. Right. That's the intermediate result we would like to keep track of. Okay. So this will be the intermediate uh, the sum so far. Okay. We create a recursive helper method. Okay. Let's give it a try. All right. So what I pr propose to do is something very similar to the group sum. However, we're going to introduce one more input parameter. Okay, I'll do the final tracing. Uh, give you a sketch at the end. Let me just uh, program the code. I'll, I'll try to talk it. I'll talk it through when we go. So we're going to do the following. We're going to say private. Usually, the recursive helper method should be private to the client. Usually, right? You don't want to make it public. Any user who want to use your method, they will only call this single one, not the private one. Okay. So you would say private, and then you're going to say return, also return the Boolean. And then I'm going to say integer rather than start. This will be the starting point. However, as we move on with our choices, we have to go from index zero, for example, index zero to index one, index one to index two. So calling start could be a little bit confusing. So let me call that something else. Let me call that just index. And also the array. Call by value, remember from year 2030, so we don't really create any intermediate array. We just pass by value. So it's always the same array that we are referring to. It's just different indices we have to refer to. And then this will be the new input parameter. Let me call it sum so far. All right. And then integer the target. Just from the design for the method here, you can see the only one we introduce is this particular input parameter, right? Everything else is the same. Well, of course, we also rename. The index over here to be index, so we can we can it'll be easier for you to understand. All right, so far so good. And then let's now try to think about different cases. Remember, whenever you program recursion, you have to think about base cases. So when do we have to exit? When do we have to say, okay, we're done? Right. The idea well, since we have to make a choice for every element in the array over here, so an obvious uh, base case would be uh, when when we actually get to the end of the array, meaning that the index over there is no longer valid. In this case, maybe if the index is actually equal to, uh, the maximum index should be two, but it gets to be three. In that case, that means we can no longer make any more choices. In that case, you have to stop the process. All right. So we're going to do, we're going to do some if conditional, right? If the current index is actually already invalid, larger than or equal to, Nonce the length. Okay, I'll make some comments over here. So that means no more numbers to choose. Make a decision now. And when I say make a decision now, so far you may have already chosen. A, okay, let's say here. So far you may have already chosen. Let's say up to here, right? Up to here. You can see we have so far we have chosen a uh, number such that the sum is actually nine. In that case. It's not going to hit the targets, right? Because the target should be actually 10, let's say, for example. And in that case, uh, we're going to return false. On the other hand, if we can go to another branch over here such that the sum actually hit the target, in that case, we should be true. So it's conditional, all right? In that case, we're going to say make a decision now. So we're going to say return whether or not the accumulated sum so far hits the targets. So we can say return sum so far equals equals the targets. Okay, that'll be one 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 uh one to really uh okay some question for you to think about. Why not write simply return for example false? 
that's something for you to think about when you study the code, all right? I'll put it there. And then we're gonna go for the else part, okay? And in this, uh, you can think about this as just one base case, right? Let's get to the else part over here. And let me see uh, what's going on over here. So we got some so far, void method, uh, actually, oh, I forgot the name of that. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's something so basic. Absolutely. Thank you. I was wondering about it. Well, you got choices over here about the name for the method. Either you can choose the same name, in which case uh, you'll be overloaded method because they got different parameters, right? But I would say typically when you say you want to create a recursive helper method, you can, you want to say helper. Let me just say helper over here. So that will also help. But you will you will you wouldn't get confused which one you want to call recursively. Thank you. Good. All right, and then the next one will be, we know that very well in the case of uh, else, that means the index is actually strictly less than non-length. So we know that it's a valid index, in which case we got to make some choice, all right? So now we're going to think about three different cases. We want to think about the relationship between num so far versus target. Well, whenever you talk about the relationship, relationship between two numbers, it can be either this is strictly less than that, or this is equal to that, well, this is larger than that. Well, we got three choices over here, right? Let's talk about it. Let me talk about, first of all, if the number, the sum so far, is exactly equal to the target. So what does that mean? I'll, I'll write some comments over here. So that means uh, sum of the group cho uh, chosen so far hits the targets. And if this is the case, what should we do? If that already hits the target, that means that there's at least one group that will hit the target. That means we are done. It will just return true, right? Otherwise, uh, else if, we got three cases, so I can use if else if. If the sum so far is strictly larger than targets over here, for example, let, let me give you one example. If you go back to the tree over here, right? Let's say, let's make the following, uh, let's say, say for example, the target that we want to hit is actually two, all right? Assuming that's two. And if I'm in this particular branch for the execution, and I hit the target five over here, does it really matter if I go any further to choose any num other number? Oh, of course, assuming that all the numbers are positive. That's what we're assuming, right? In that case, we don't really need to choose any further because this is already strictly larger than the target, which is two. So by choosing any other number, it's not going to make a difference. So that means we, uh, this particular choosing strategy simply just failed. So we got to return false. That's the intuition, all right? So I'm going to say return false over here, all right? And the final one over here is the interesting bit. That's really where the recursive call uh, is going to be made, all right? Let's now take a look. Okay, that one there. Let me make a comment over here. That means the sum so far equals equal uh, sorry is strictly less than target so what does that mean that means there is some scope of choosing more numbers into the group All right that's the intuition and now guys i want to pause a little bit i want you to guys if you kind of kind of understood what i have said so far let's think about how we should write this part so far, we didn't make any recursive call, right? We defined this helper method over here. I never, we, we never called that. So strictly speaking, this is base case number one. And this is base case number two. And this is base case number three. We haven't got any base cases yet. Uh, we haven't got any recursive cases yet. So now, we want to somehow construct a Boolean condition over here such that it is going to move on to choosing more numbers. However, when you choose more number, for example, let's say this. Let's say uh, in this example still, let's say the target is actually five, all right? I'm now here. Two is strictly less than the target five. I definitely know I can actually uh, go on to choose more numbers, but I cannot simply just go one way. I should be able to go either this way over here or this way over here. 
But how do I specify that as a recursive call? Somehow, I want a recursion to really do that for me, to say, you can either go this way or you can go that way. And then recursively, every time we hit some branch over here, you will either go this way or that way. That's really the tricky part. But once I put a code and give you some tracing idea, that's something you will have to think a little bit more deeply yourself and maybe come back to me if you got further questions. That should be the way to uh, tackle this uh, difficult problem. All right. I will pause here just maybe for a few moments. Do you guys have any idea or some thoughts about what to put over here? That'll be the final part. You guys can uh, think about it. We got uh, about 15 minutes left before 5.30. I want the finishing time. So I would say with uh, another few minutes to finish the implementation. And then we'll do some quick tracing together. Anybody, if you want to suggest anything. Yeah, we want to do, you, uh, I think John, you meant two recursive call. One with and the other one without current choice. That's a very good thought. We definitely want to somehow to say either you can go that way or go this way, right? Okay, I think that's a very good thing. Let's say if we are here, we can either go for this way or you can go for that way. If either one works, that means we got a group that will hit the target. So now remember, we can either go for this way, eventually you're gonna tell us whether going this way can eventually have some hitting group. We can also go this way, which can also eventually tell us whether we can get a hitting group. As long as one of them hits, a, uh, hits the targets, in that case, you'll be okay. So we should really, we, we wanna say, or either this will work or this will work. We don't need, we cannot say n percent, n percent, because if we do this instead, it's gonna be that this must work and this must work either to include or to exclude the current choice, right? All right, let's now take, uh, take a look, right? What's gonna happen is we're gonna say return over here. And the format is gonna be a conjunction, uh, like a disjunction over here. Either to include, include the current number, which is A index, or we don't want to include it. All right, over here. And to if, if we, uh, we really want to include it, we want to make a recursive call over here. Let's let's let me copy this. Okay, so what should we fill in? So now this index will actually tell us what will be the next number to choose. In that case, we're gonna say index plus one. Right? It's a little bit like a, in the basic recursion on the race. Whenever you want to move to the next part of the array, you want to say plus one. So we will know we can move the pointer to uh, to the right by one position. Right? And this one here is easy. We don't really change it because it's gonna be the same array that we're gonna examine. And here, none so far is really the critical bit, right? Whatever value it is for the current call, we're gonna include a index. So that means we're gonna do the following. We're gonna say uh, sum so far plus a at index position. Oh, sorry, not a, nums, I meant. Right, and then the target over here, we don't change it. So if you look at the solution on coding back, they somehow try to be very concerned about every time they will subtract something from target. I don't do that. I want to see very explicitly about what's the sum so far and what's the target that we want to hit, which is always the same. I think that'll be easier for, for us to understand. So that'll be the target. This will be one call, and the other one will be just another recursive call, right? And in this case, the only difference will be I don't need to include it. So this corresponds to, for example, you can see, if the sum so far is two over here, I can either go this way, which will include a one, which is two. In that case, uh, oh, sorry, let me say that again. Let's say I'm here. If I chose to include a one, which is three over here, in that case, the sum so far will be five. On the other hand, if I actually go for this way, which uh, which does not include uh, this, in that case, some so far just remain to be the same, two. That's exactly what we're doing. So when you review your code, go back to this particular tree structure. So that's exactly what we're doing, all right? I believe that's about it, okay? So let's now make sure this one is really working, right? So what I can try now, 
I don't have any test cases program yet, but I think uh, what we can do is let's go to coding bed over here, copy and paste. All right, just copy and paste. And if I say go, I do have some failing cases. Let me see what I got wrong over here. Give me a moment. Let, uh, let me see target and target over here. Guys, bear with me. I do have the working solution on my notes. Maybe I make some typo at some point over there. So you need to, oh, sorry. This is the missing part again. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, I think the recursive helper method is uh, correct. Nothing wrong. Okay. After defining this, we have to call that. Otherwise, what's the point, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you always return false. Thank you. Okay. What we got to do is we're going to call that. Group some helper over here. Let's call that thing over there. Okay. And now what should we call? So now in this case, whatever star it is, you want to put start. Don't put zero. Okay, because uh, when, when a user uses this particular method, they might pass uh, any arbitrary starting point. So you don't want to say zero always, right? It's going to be start, also array, and the sum so far to begin with will be zero, right? And also what will be the target, whatever target it is, right? So that'll be the one, that'll be the way. Let me copy and paste again, all right? All right, let's now, uh, let me just replace it like this, all right? Okay, let's now go for that. All correct. All right. One exercise for you, which maybe I wouldn't do, you can do it. If you got a trouble doing it, let me know. Uh, so you can see all the test cases that coding that run on my code. You can try to convert one or some of them into uh, JUnit test cases, which we wouldn't have time to do. I want to use the final five to 10 minutes to trace the code together with you guys, just to make sure you can understand it um, better. Okay, I think that's more important than just writing some JUnit test cases at this point. So uh, up to now, we got some working version. I'll make the source code available to you today. It's a challenging one, I know, but I think that you always want to challenge yourself. Otherwise, you wouldn't grow. Okay, give it a try, and then I'll bring maybe some slightly easier but similar problem next time you can try again. So we're going to keep trying, right, for recursion. And try to convert some test cases yourself, and then uh, study this problem here. You can feel free to ask me during the Q and A uh, next week or office hour if you got any doubts about why we are programming this recursion this way. I think you will learn a lot from this example. All right. The final thing I would like to do is to trace the code very quickly to get it with you guys. All right. And let me use. Uh, oh, before that, let me give you some follow up exercise. All right. If you go back to the coding bed, okay, very quickly, and then I'll do the tracing, and then we are done. If you go back to the coding bed, and then this is a different one, it's something called, uh, let me show to you how you can get there. Okay, let me show to you quickly. If you go back there uh, to coding bed, go back to Java over here and go to recursion number two, uh, sorry, go to recursion two over here. And by the way, the one we just saw is actually H, that means hard, right? It's definitely hard, okay? If you go to group sound six, that will be the extra exercise I will encourage you guys to do. This one here turns out to be incredibly similar to group sum, which we just solved. So this will be my challenge to you. Can you adapt the solution to the group sum for this problem over here? Meaning I can simply copy and paste the code. However, you have to make some minimum, uh, minimal changes, maybe a few lines of code. By doing that, you will be able to solve this problem. So what I want you to do is to study this problem over here carefully to see what the difference is. Basically, they're trying to make some restriction about how you might choose the number. Okay, that's something I will give to you. And then I can go over the solution of this. Now, maybe not tomorrow. I want you to have enough time to think about it. Maybe I'll talk about solution of this next week when we come back. All right. The final thing I want to do is to trace it together with you. Okay. Let's say we uh, the example we want to do is how about this one here? The group sum over here and then two, four, eight, and then 10, okay? Let me trace it together with you quickly. Group sum, and then starting with zero, and then array A over here, zero, one, two, and then two four eight and then i'll simply put a over here right just easier for me to write and then i'm going to say the target is actually 10. 
Right, guys? Let's now try to trace it together quickly, right? Hopefully, that can be done within uh, 5 to 10 minutes, right? First of all, this method itself is not recursive, but you will call the recursive helper method. So what I will do is I'm going to call the recursive helper method group sum helper, right? The index to start with will be zero. The same array, initially the sum will just be zero. I mean, I'll use pink to keep track. And then it's going to be a target, which will always remain to be the same, all right? Let me do one more thing. You want to um, pay attention to the second, uh, first and third parameters. The first one will be the starting point over here. Okay. All right. Let's now see what we can do over here. And this one, as you will see, this is definitely not the uh, base case, right? First of all, you can see the index over here. Well, if you think about the array the length, a the length, in this case, is actually equal to three. You can see the zero index is still uh the index uh zero is still a valid index, right? So it's not a base case. And also the uh sum so far is not hitting 10. So we are still in the base case, right? None of them actually is true. How do we do it? So we're gonna run the recursive call. If you recall, that's going to be something like this. I'm gonna do it directly so you'll see the pattern. All right, I'll I'll let you study the code more carefully yourself, right? What's gonna happen is we're gonna return the following. We're going to return to say either go for this way over here or we go for this way over here. Okay. And it's going to be this junction, right? Return this or this. And for this one here, it's going to include, let's say, include, uh, let's say, A. Remember, zero is going to be included. And this will be A, zero, not included, right? So either way. So either included or not included conceptually. All right. So now we're going to see how we can trace it. So it's going to be a recursive called group sum helper. And then it's going to say here we're going to, uh, once we are done with the index zero, we have to increase the index by one. So it's going to be zero to one over here. And then we got the same array, A. However, now the sum should be updated, right? You can see zero over here, and we got to include a zero. A zero is two, so that'll be two plus zero. So that'll be two. Like that, right? And then there will be another separate recursive call, group sum over here. And then because we, are, we have already dealt with zero, so the next one to choose will be actually one, right? The same. And then the same array, but now what should be this value over here? Anyone, any idea? What should be this value over here? Anyone? It's very important to actually understand this. Zero. Awesome. You guys are uh, following. Very good. Okay. Let me do one more level together with you. And then I think uh, com combined with the tree over here that's informal, you guys will know how to trace it completely. All right. Let's now do one more level. Okay, let's see. So here we got either we can go for the oh, let's see if they are the base cases, first of all. One is still valid index. So not base case. Two, oh actually I forgot to actually put uh, the target back. Beg your pardon. So this will be still the target remain to be 10, right? Remain to be 10. You can see we two is strictly less than 10. So that means we are not hitting the tar target just yet. So we're going to make further recursive call. Also, zero is strictly less than 10. All right. So what I will do is I will try to go further over here, go further over here, go further over here, and go further over here. The current index is one. So that means we want to make a choice about whether to include a one or not. Right. So here it's going to be a one or not a one. This will be A1 or not A1, right? You can see that's exactly what we said uh, informally about the tree. This is exactly how the recursive call will be uh, re uh, will be unfolded. Let's see here. Let me do one more level and then uh, group some helper over here. Apparently, we're going to make sure we also move on to the next index, right? And then the same array A over here. And then in this case, 2 and plus A1 which will be two plus four, which will be six. 
And then we are still having the same targets, which will be 10. Okay, let me move this a little bit there. Okay, let me complete this level over here and then I'll tell you what, what to do after that. So group sum helper over here. In that case, we are also moving to index two, the same. And then the same over here, okay. I think I will be able to copy this so you can, can save some writing for later. All right, so here, this is actually not to include A1. So that means just two directly. And then we also got uh, 10 over here, the same target, right? Hopefully so far so good. Okay, one more over here. So for this one here, we're gonna, currently the target is actually zero. We want to include A1, which is four. So that'll be zero plus four, that'll be four. And then 10. You can see the pattern over here. That's why I don't need to complete the whole thing. You see the pattern over here. And the final one is group sum helper. In that case, oh, actually, I can just copy and paste, can I not? Okay, this one over here, I can make it a little bit smaller over here, the final one, okay? And then it's going to be, so zero over here, and then it simply doesn't choose anything. So that'll be just zero. And then it's going to be target 10. So what have we got so far? Let me summarize, let me conclude. What we have got so far is about A0 and also A1. We got one, two, three, four possibility. Exactly about the mathematical analysis we did, either to choose this or not, and to choose this or not. So we got two times two, four possibility. And this correspond to the four recursive call down at, the, uh, down at this level over here. Things must go on until we hit the base case. So what, what I would suggest for you guys to do over here is to exercise. You gotta do it once, you know, for complete, and for completeness. Complete the tracing, complete the tree. And to see why eventually we can get to one group that will hit the 10. That's something we wanna do, all right? All right, guys, uh, any question? I see one question here from Haofan. The running time is actually not that uh, great because we got to consider all the possibilities. So eventually it's based almost exponential, right? But it's unavoidable because for solving this problem over here, you have to consider all the possible groups in the worst case. But that's uh, definitely one problem you will have to know how to solve. Sometimes you have to go to exponential if it has to be the case. All right, guys, let me recap about this particular hard problem over here. I think uh, this is what you should do uh, after this session, and especially when you still got a little bit fresh about the details. Number one, once I release the code to you, try to look through each line of the code and with the comments together, with uh, make sure you kind of understand what's going on, and then go back to this tree over here and make sure you understand about conceptually what's happening over here. And then try to trace for a particular input, for example, this one, try to trace it completely to see how exactly you can return eventually to the result, either being true or false. And then consider this additional problem over here, which will require some adaptation for that solution. So these will be the things I think you should do. And then feel free to contact me later if you want to talk more about this problem here. It's a difficult one, but I think uh, once I try to give you some guidance, hopefully it's not too bad. Right? You want to learn uh, how to solve challenging one as well. And for next week, I'll bring another one, possibly the easier one. So for you to uh, solve further. And I will release the video recording. I'm going to have my dinner now, and then I'm going to hopefully release by 8 p.m. Okay? You guys should really have dinner as well, right? And then worry about the recursion thing, maybe after your dinner. All right, guys, I hope you enjoy the session here. It's a challenging one, but I think uh, that's really what we want in the Q&A, right? We, so we, we really got a luxury during the Q&A to solve something challenging. All right. Uh, sir, excuse me, can you go to the code please for one second? Yeah. Just ah. for one second. Oh, sorry, uh, Adam, what was your question? Uh, can, could you please go to the code? Uh, yeah. I, I want to take a screenshot because I want to work on oh, it. Oh, yeah, now. sure. If you want to do it right away, that's not a problem. Thank you. Yeah, guys, if you want to take a screenshot, okay, first of all, take this one first. Go go ahead. I'll wait for a few seconds. Oh, my God. Oh, too bad. You guys got a class until 7, too bad. So you're going to have your dinner around 7, too bad. All right. Yeah, that's a recursive helper method. There you go. Thanks, sir.
No problem. What will I have for my dinner? I gotta ask my mom. <laughs> my mom is cooking dinner. I don't know what they are cooking. All right, guys, thank you for coming. I think、uh, I hope you enjoy and keep going. I think recursion is difficult. I think we're gonna do this hopefully for well later Q and A. We're gonna do other problems, but I'll try to do whenever I can. I think recursion is really important. All right, guys, you take care, and then I'll see you later.